Holcomb is a small city located in Kansas, in the United States. As of 2010, the population was of 2,094 people. The place is a little bit of an oxymoron. It seems like the classic, sleepy American town where not much happens, but it has been in the spotlight of literature, journalism, and true crime for 62 years. Back in the late 50s, the population was less than 300 people and everyone seemed to know one another. And the Clutter family, with Herb Clutter as the patriarch, his wife Bonnie, and their kids Nancy, Kenyon, Ivana, and Beverly, were very well known and loved in the small community. The couple and the two younger siblings, Nancy and Kenyon, resided in a large farmhouse with 14 rooms and large amounts of land destined for agriculture. They were a happy, hard-working, religious family, heavily involved in their community's social life. A woman named Connie Panic recalls the family and their active participation in the community. They were not a pretentious family. They were a down-to-earth, good, wholesome Kansas family. Herb was very active in the community, helping whatever he could. I remember we would have school events and he would be there being very supportive. Herbert Clatter was 48 in 1959. He had graduated from Kansas State College in 1933 with a degree in agriculture. He was a member of the First United Methodist Church and the Federal Farm Credit Board. During his humble beginnings in agriculture, he established River Valley Farm, where he specialized in growing wheat and fruit trees. He had made what some people considered a small fortune using new technology to grow wheat, becoming a pioneer in the field. He was known to be a fair and generous employer. He married his wife in 1934, and in 1939, he started his farming enterprise in Holcomb. He was a leader in his community, respectable, and his family were loved. And above all, he was a loving father who supported his children in school and extracurricular activities. Bonnie was 45 at the time. She had studied to be a nurse and she married Herbert when she was 20 and she supported every one of his endeavors. In the book by Truman Capote in Cold Blood, she is depicted as being incapacitated by clinical depression and other physical ailments, but people who knew her expect to differ. According to her loved ones, she was a loving mother with an active role in her community and church. She did suffer from some form of depression. It is thought that it might have been postpartum depression from when Kenyon was born, and some people have spoken of seeing a change in her appearance and demeanor towards the last years of her life. But luckily for her, this did not stop her from living a regular life. She was active in her community, caring and compassionate. She loved the ocean and dolls, and she supported her children's activities and tried to attend all their 4-H events and school plays. Kenyon was only 15 at the time. Not much is told about Kenyon. I could not find that much information about him online. The only information I have about him is the one I can recall from in Cold Blood. He liked spending time by himself entertaining himself with carpentry and building electronic gadgets. Supposedly he had one really good friend, but they had been drifting apart because his friend had taken an interest in girls and Kenyon had not reached that stage. But that's information from the novel and we should acknowledge that Capote did take his liberties with it. So take it with a pinch of salt. It's a shame because I would have liked to know more about Kenyon and tell you about him. Nancy was a wonderful 16 year old girl. She was a role model for all the little girls in the community. She was the girl who could do it all. She was very involved with the 4-H club, where she was a project leader and where she taught cooking classes to the younger members. She was kind, sweet, and smart. In a 2005 article by Lauren's journal World, she is described as being very pretty, with brown hair curled at the ends, sparkling eyes, a wide, girlish smile. 
She had an easy laugh, and there wasn't a mean bone in her body. She was in 4-H, went to church every Sunday, and made top grades. Until her murder at age 16, Nancy Clatter was everyone's friend. It was the Sunday of November the 15th when the teenagers Nancy Edwell and Susan Kidwell headed to the Clatter house to pick up Nancy to go to church and they made a gruesome discovery. Her friend laid in bed, covered in blood, deceased. Hours later, officers arrived to find the four residents of the farm murdered. All of them were shot in the head with a shotgun and Herb was tortured. He was stabbed and his throat slashed. Bonnie and Nancy were found in their bedrooms. Kenyon and Herb were found in different parts of the basement. Detective Alvin Dewey from the Kansas Bureau of Investigations, one of Herbert's many acquaintances, assembled a task force to solve the case. The only lead the investigators had was a bloody footprint that was only visible in a photograph of the crime scene and some tire tracks. It was also discovered that a pair of binoculars and a transistor radio had been taken from the house. But other than that, no valuables were missing. The house had not been ransacked and Bonnie's jewelry was left untouched. The case seemed unsolvable for a while, until Christmas of that year when Alvin Dewey got a major lead from a prisoner at Kansas State Prison. Floyd Wells was willing to open his mouth and spill the secret in exchange for the $1,000 reward that was offered, and so he did. Wells was a former employee of Herbert Clatter and he knew about the family's wealth. He talked about it with a fellow inmate who took an interest in the Clatters, and more specifically in a safe containing $10,000 that was rumored to be kept in Herbert's office. The man's name was Richard Haycock. He was a 33-year-old man convicted of theft who started scheming with a newly released prisoner to break into the farm and steal the money. His partner in literal crime, Perry Smith, a 36-year-old man who served a sentence for stealing a car. Now I'm not gonna go into detail about their lives because I'd rather focus on who the clatters were. There are many other videos that delved into their biographies and you can read in cold blood if you're interested. Capote took his liberties by tweaking truth here and there, but it's an interesting read. On the night of November the 14th, the pair drove 400 miles in a black Chevrolet. They headed towards the farm. They entered the house through an unlocked door when the family was asleep, and awoke each member of the family. They wanted Herb safe. The rumors weren't true, and no safe was in the house. They took 50 bucks from Herb and executed the family in separate rooms. The whole of Holcomb was in shock once the news broke. A reward for information of $10,000 was set up, and almost 600 people attended the funerals of the family. The criminals fled to Kansas, where Hickok wrote some bad checks. They traveled to Mexico for a short period of time, and once they ran out of money, they hitchhiked their way back to California, then Nebraska, then Iowa, where they stole a car to return to Kansas only to leave the state again. First they headed to Florida, and then to Nevada, where they were finally apprehended. When they were arrested, they were still driving the stolen car and most importantly, they still had the boot that had made the print at the crime scene. A team of investigators, led by Dewey, flew to Nevada and they got both men to confess. On March the 29th, 1960, Hickok and Smith were found guilty and sentenced to death. They were executed by hanging on April 14th, 1964. And this is how two people ended the life of four humans and brought terror and distrust to a small community. The Clatters were loved and respected, and who knows what else they could have achieved had their lives not been cut short. This is only part of the story. I left out many details, but I just wanted to focus a little bit more on the family. 
If you want to know more about this, as I said before, there are some videos about the case out there that are very well researched. I think Georgia Marie has a 30 minute video or so on the case. Go watch her, she's fantastic. And this is all for today. I know it's a small video, but I had a really tough couple of weeks, so this is what you get for today. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.